percent of the people here are people who've joined before. Some of you have joined many times. And that's why what we are increasingly trying to do is to have a conversation. We really value these conversations and remember they are recorded, they are turned into visuals and that's what Chris Shipton is doing. And the recordings themselves are easily downloaded if you've got a fast interconnect, internet connection. And I am hearing that they are viewed a lot, including by groups of people who want an opportunity to see what's happening in discussions about COVID. So for me, the fact that we are connected, the fact that we are all part of a family makes me all the more convinced that I would like each of you to be ready to say a remark or two during this discussion. Now, what do I mean by that? I really like it if you can make your statements in the space of about two minutes. That's 200 words. And if you choose your words carefully, you can make very strong statements in a short space of time. And then we can get the discussion going between people. As I say, I'm still looking very much at schools and return to school or university. I'm looking at the situations where COVID tends to be transmitted, i.e. factories, particularly coal factories. And I'm looking at COVID transmission in outdoor events, uh, be they uh, social events or work events uh, where people are gathered together often outside. I just want to acknowledge by the way that Scott Knox is here uh, and Scott it's super important that you're with us and I hope you're ready to talk. Now the theme that I've been working on over the last two weeks is, the, is the, under the following strap line, rising to the COVID ready challenge. Together equitably, and now. Let me break it up. Rising to the COVID ready challenge. I reckon that at this time, around 7.8 billion people are coming to terms with this COVID and what it means. They're having all sorts of challenges. They're trying to deny it. They're getting frustrated about it. They're cross with their governments, cross with their employers, cross with people like me, because it's disturbing to their view of how life normally works. And they want things to get back to what they believe to be normal. And they'd like to be able to get on. They hate the fact that businesses are going bankrupt, that large employers are laying off so many staff, that they themselves can't make predictions about what's happening in the coming weeks and months. People do not like this uncertainty. They do not like the frustration that comes from just not being able to plan even the basic things of seeing the grandchildren again. And so there's a frustration and, and it's deep. And so I'm saying we've all got to rise to this challenge. It's the challenge of having lives that are COVID ready being ready to be able to deal with COVID. And we've got to do it together. I mean, I appreciate that there are some who believe that if we work separately, we can gain comparative advantage. We can work independently. Do you know, humanity solves problems by working together. Humanity experiences horrendous challenges by working in competition. And it's suppressing the urge to compete and finding inside ourselves that wonderful core of being cooperative that gets us the best results. Somehow it's out of fashion, okay? It's in fashion to compete. It's in fashion to basically try to defeat the neighbor. I mean, competition leads us to do extraordinary things on the road, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools, in our universities. And some of those are very good. Competition does bring out lots of good in us. But when we're dealing with a common enemy, an enemy that has the capacity to really cause problems in our midst, an enemy about which we don't have full knowledge, 
an enemy that seems to be changing all the time, then there's no substitute for working together. And that, of course, is what I'm working for, and that's what I think all of you are working for, is finding the essential elements in life that enable us to work together without somehow feeling that it makes us less good as people. And so, that's what the COVID Ready Challenge is. It's being ready to deal with COVID as a collective, as a united family, as a community that can put working together above competition. I go back to my basic points, but I'll do them fast this time so that we can move into the discussion quickly. Starting point. Fast, starting point, starting point. Number one, one, one. What is it? Remember, this is a dangerous virus. Somehow we used to think it's just easy, it only affects a few people, most of us recover and we're fine. Not true. We used to think it doesn't affect children. Not true. We used to think that somehow people in poor countries are going to get away with it more easily. Not true. This is a dangerous virus that affects lots of people badly and that affects some people for a particularly long period. Let's keep remembering that. And let's remember it kills people. A very close friend of mine died yesterday as a result of COVID. After more than 100 days of fighting bravely in and out of intensive care, one of the strongest and pluckiest women I know. Yeah, and she's lost the battle, but she fought hard. But that's the case for so many, so many thousands of people. And it's bearing in mind that there are thousands of people dying as a result of this and thousands and thousands more whose lives are being damaged. Sportsmen and women who are just losing the will to be athletic and competitive because they just cannot get their lungs working again. Or people who just can't get back to work because they're suffering chronic fatigue. And there are tens of thousands of people in that category. And go on reminding ourselves as our starting point, it's a dangerous virus and it's not going away, okay? I don't, I don't apologize for saying this. And I know that some people look at me oddly when I say it's dangerous and it's everywhere and it's not going away. And then I go further and I say, it's actually affecting poor people the worst. And they look at me and I say, just think if you're poor, if you don't have wealth, if you don't have space in your home to isolate, if you don't have the opportunity to work from home, you get it much worse. Okay, so that's my starting point. Heading one, go to heading two. So what do we do about it? Let's just keep these seven things that I'm about to say at top of mind. One, get everybody adopting the universal precautions of physical distancing, hygiene, wearing face coverings, and isolating when symptomatic. What I call universal precautions, I want them to be everywhere. I want them to be absolutely mandatory in public places. I want them vital in public transport. I want them essential when people are forced to be close together. And I want everybody to be not so much forced to do them by law, but I want them to become the habit. Good practice like washing our hands when we've been to the toilet. So the universal precautions on COVID have got to be practiced everywhere. Second inside this is I want public health services to be credited and loved and made to work. And by that, I mean the services that are available in every community, everywhere, looked after by health officers. And then I want thirdly integrated action so that we've got local businesses, mosques, churches, universities, schools, community organizations, local government offices, all different entities together at the local level, 
working together seamlessly. It's how we've done every single disease control issue I've ever been involved in, getting groups to work together and partnering with each other. And the, any of this habit that's emerged of suggesting that we can somehow separate it, and not need any kind of local integration, they're wrong. Let's get that local integration right. Fourthly, keep essential health care going. I've just got a, a, a Marianne sitting there and she will understand what I'm talking about. I've got a report from Plan International about the fact that reproductive health services for women, particularly in India, have just fallen apart in the last few weeks. That women in India are not able to get reproductive health services. They're not able to get family planning. They're not able to get abortions. The services have collapsed, mostly because people are taking off, being taken off, offering reproductive health care, and are being put onto COVID work. And what I'm saying to you is, we've got to keep essential health care going, services for everybody, and that's got to be high on our list. And then I want to be sure that we're paying attention to those who provide care. The carers, too many of them are dying. I've got all sorts of new data on the deaths and suffering among health workers throughout the world. Let's communicate clearly and consistently. Let's make certain that all leaders recognize that there, theirs is a duty to focus on protection. Theirs is a duty to give straight messages and simply creating Competition on messaging between political leaders is just absolutely unacceptable. It will lead to suffering. It will lead to death. We've got to stop that. And then we need dashboards, simple dashboards that everybody can access that show how things are going. It's no good just knowing that cases are going up in Spain. What we also need to know is whether contact traces, tracing is working, whether people who are expected to isolate are getting some kind of support from the state to do so, or whether health services are continuing to function, despite the fact that there's an increase in cases. It's that dashboard of seven essential characteristics that's necessary. So into my second heading of my five headings, I've got seven points that have got to be in place that I've just given the seven strategic principles. Twi and I are putting this all out in the narrative that we're releasing later today. I just want to stress there are seven strategic principles. I'll just recite them again. Universal precaution to everybody. Well-functioning public health services. Integrated local level action. Essential health care still provided. Healthcare providers properly protected particularly with, the same, with personal protective equipment. Clear and consistent communication and performance indicators accessible to everybody. My heading three is things that we've got to do. I'm hopeful my colleague John will feel ready to talk about this. I want to be sure that at local level, we really give a lot of credit for the detectives, those special people who can work out where the virus is and why it's there, the people who discover the outbreaks that have come from discotheques, people who discover that there are factories still uh, having clusters of cases. These detectives, they're vital. Let's make sure also that we link the detectives to the people who don't mind breaking up the clusters. That doesn't mean they stigmatize the people. It doesn't mean they're unkind to them. It doesn't mean they treat them rough. It doesn't mean they bring out law and order to try to somehow um, uh, isolate people. Let's do the cluster busting with love and with support and really crediting the people who are at the center of it. The, the workers in the Norfolk uh, chicken plant that have had to isolate or the people in garment factories around the world or the migrant fruit pickers in California Let's credit those who are working with them and say what heroes they are. Because if we stigmatize, we will lose. And let's 
all the time be building trust between all the people who are involved because working to deal with this COVID is a public service. And let's try at all times to keep saying the thing that really matters. People are the solution and the virus is the problem. Keep saying it. Virus is problem, people are solution. People solution, virus the problem. Sing it, shout it, say it. Because unless we can get that message across, we will go on seeing people being stigmatized. Now that's my third heading, is about those wonderful people who work at local level, who make the effort come to life. They are not being given credit enough. I want them to be really labeled the real heroes, the detectives, the cluster busters, those who include everybody, the people who make meaningful connections and build trust. They're the ones that really matter. So to my fourth heading relates to what are the things that, where, that I really think have to be making a difference in the coming weeks and months. We've got to get better diagnostics. It is absurd that we have tens of thousands of people around the world at the moment waiting two or three days for the results of their virus tests. And some of them are never going to get them because the virus tests just can't cope. I got terrible stories from countries all over the world and including rich countries, including very rich countries, saying we can't get the test results to the people because things are breaking down in the PCR labs and we're running out of reagents. And then there are other people saying, there's no point in doing the nasal swabs because we can't get the results. So let's just make certain that the diagnostics gets given higher, higher uh, uh, emphasis. And then therapies. I want people looking at cheap therapies more widely, whether it's statins and angiotensin reuptake blockers or other similar low-cost off-patent remedies that have been shown from some of the case studies to reduce mortality by 20 or 30 percent. Let's look at these things in clearer light and not just spend money on expensive and new antivirals. And let's keep using the treatments that we know work, like oxygen. Early oxygen therapy saves lives. And let's remember, let's remember that actually if you get to people early, that you are less likely to need to ventilate them. And once you ventilate, you've got big problems. And if you can keep your weight down, so much the better. So therapies and diagnostics, and then access to protective equipment. I'm putting these all really hard. I want the vaccine and I want the vaccine people to go on doing the vaccines. And I'm really delighted that we've got more than 100 vaccines being looked at. But I'm saying at the same time, please let's get more diagnostics to everybody. I'm so pleased that a new antigen test has been developed and it's been marketed by Abbott. But I want more of these quick tests on, on offer, particularly those that use lateral flow techniques. Uh, and I want them more widely available because surely we ought to be better off than we are right now, still so dependent on PCRs. So my fourth heading is access to diagnostics and vaccines. And my fifth heading and last is, please also let's work for a global campaign. I talked before about the challenge of getting COVID ready and doing it in ways that are bringing us together and equitable. I want you, please, to work with me to bring the world together. It is extraordinary that the world leaders are still behaving as though each country is doing its own experiment. Each country is doing it in its own way. And I'm so pleased that WHO people, Tedros and his team, the regional directors at the six regional offices of WHO and all the staff, as they keep working, and they, many of them have not had holidays, are still totally advocating a collective and unified response, even if leaders don't want to do it, because that's the only way you deal with this. We have really benefited from Maria Van Kerkova uh, and the others in the epidemiology team, but painstaking work on children and masks, painstaking work on how important 
aerosol spread is. Painstaking work on ways in which we can improve hygiene. Painstaking work on what is the role of surfaces in spreading the disease. You know, it's that kind of global intellectual effort to bring together all the evidence that's available. All the 500 papers a day that are being published. We need that. And so as part of the campaign, I'm asking for continued support for WHO and for the global networks that it supports. I'm asking for comprehensive precautions everywhere. I'm asking for locally adapted community-based action. Keep it local. I'm asking for essential health services for all everywhere. Stop putting services on one side saying we, that's because of COVID. Think harder, think better, keep your health services going. I want prioritization of poor people and poor people's needs. I want us all to try to think through what being poor really means when you're asked to go into confinement and to accept some kind of lockdown. And I want this public dashboards everywhere to show progress and all efforts to ensure equitable access to diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop making these points. I'm not going to stop doing my bit to try to confront global leaders with what I see as the really irresponsible nature of the lack of collective action, lack of working across borders, lack of working within countries between different political parties, lack of working between competitors, even sometimes in the business space, a lack of working regionally and globally. You know, future generations, in five years time or 10 years time, when the history is written, will be just scratching their heads with wonderment at the fact that leaders still feel that they get greater credit from their electorate by working separately than by working together against a common enemy. Thanks very much indeed for the chance to speak to you all on this. Uh, I'm now going to uh, just simply invite some of the people in the team to just join and give your own uh, observations on what I've just said if you want to. And a very important member of the team today is Chris Shipton. Chris, you're the illustrator we like when you get your um, work highlighted. Here it is. If you wouldn't mind just unmuting and just saying a word, we love having you with us, Chris. Over to you. Hi, David. Um, I find it so interesting. Since I, before I did this, I was agonizing about whether to wear a mask in the supermarket. We're so slow in the UK at dealing with these seven points. Um, I'm not sure you'll be pleased to know Last week, I actually told somebody off on the bus for not wearing a mask. So I suppose that's a bit of uh, development on my part. Thank you very much, Chris. Please be careful. In a funny way, we're dealing with a whole load of intolerance around mask wearing, with people who ask others to wear masks sometimes getting hit. And I, I mean, I think it's really, really important that those of us who feel we can continue not just to set the example, but to make the point. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and now I'd like to go to uh, my colleague, Catherine. Uh, Catherine's next to me. Uh, we'll come after her to Twee and to John. Just Catherine, if you want to say any remarks at this point, uh, uh, turn on your video if you like. Oh, brilliant, sorry, it's just I can't see it. No, Excuse of course. Well, welcome to, welcome to everybody. Um, I just want to echo David's messages. We have been thinking a lot today about the need for community solidarity, unity, and support. And um, if, you know, as we go forward in, in the next month and, and we really become a, a world that's COVID ready and lives with COVID, I think there couldn't be any more important principles than those. So I, I think that's, that's for me at the moment, I think, the, I, I, might, I might mention just on a personal note, my children have just gone back to school and we are on tender hooks waiting to see how that goes. But the school seems to be doing a good job and uh, it is nice to have them having that experience. 
So I'm personally engaged in the question of schools as well, and we'll keep everybody updated on school data as it comes in. I may have made a mistake with the microphone for Catherine. I thought I'd plug my microphone in, but Jane sent a message saying we can't hear you. Uh, so sorry about that. We will improve things. Uh, we learn while doing, and um, we're actually getting better, but we're not as good as we'd like to be. To John Atkinson, please, who brings systems leadership to our team. Uh, I hope he's on. John, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here, David. Been listening carefully as ever. Um, and there's two things that you said that, that sort of struck a chord with me. The first is this local level response. And you're crediting the detectives and the, and the cluster busters and the people who are being the solution and the virus, the problem. I think the thing that I remember in it all that you've taught me is, is that outbreaks are local. We can talk about the rate in a country, but it doesn't tell us what's going on. And where we're trying to deal with something local, it's so important that we ask ourselves the right questions. Namely, what's going on here? That's the detective work. The nature of the outbreak in Leicester will be different to the nature of what's happening in Lisbon, will be different to what's happening in Luanda. Everywhere's different. And unless we understand what's happening, we can't do the next thing, which is to look at what do I need to do next and where do I need to go? How do I intervene? Until I can make those choices, I don't know what's right to do. So in the local piece, it's really, really critical that we don't just look at things on a national level, we think about things locally. The other thing you spoke about, David, was this competition. And the thing that competition does is it fragments identity. It pits one group of people against another, and when that happens, we undermine trust. And once trust is gone, it's so hard to get people to realize and make sensible choices about what they need to do with regard to risk, with regard to the things that they're doing every single day, whether it's, as Chris said, going to the supermarket, going to the shops, uh, because if we don't trust the information we're getting, we don't trust our sources, we find ourselves anxious and uneasy and the tension rises and it's so much harder to get everything done. So those things that you were saying about local and about competition, really important to me. John, thank you. I'd like to really um, stress John's point there. We actually believe that introducing trust as a desired variable to build into leadership work is absolutely essential. We think where there is trust, leadership is immensely powerful often so powerful that you can't actually demonstrate it, where trust is lacking, then leadership becomes much, much tougher. Some great philosophers have said to me, uh, sorry, have said over the years, power that is exercised through violence is much weaker than power that is exercised through trust. And I suppose I've held on to that all my life. And I think continuing to remind ourselves that we've got to learn to be able to lead through earning trust is key. John, thank you. And John, it's a very important moment to say to you, John Atkinson, over two years that I've known you, how important this is and how much I appreciate the work that you and your colleagues in Heart of the Art are doing. I'd like, like to um, just spend a moment or two now roaming around but before i go too far to twee twee you have been working in this space with us on and off but with many others what have you heard today and what have you got that you'd like to share i think relevant to the poll results here i'm particularly interested in connecting people connecting with each other engaging with each other and making sure that the communication is clear and relevant and I'm looking at a message that Marianne put in there around making sure that we're engaging everyone uh, and it's better to be age responsive. And I think that that's super important. So, so for me, that's always top of mind in how we communicate from 4SD our messages as well. And so on that note, looking at the poll results, um, it's good to see who we're connecting with. As I mentioned before, very happy to see uh, people joining from the uh, regions. I mentioned Africa. Europe and uh, in America. Age range, I'm so happy to see a very good spread across the different age ranges. We even have five people under 30, 
those of you who've been with us before uh, know that that was a gap early on. So very happy to see that. And then lastly, around how we're all feeling. Overwhelmingly in the top half, positive. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the most uh, response we got was on optimism. Um, so not quite at the top yet. And then a few people further down feeling overwhelmed, uh, discouraged or insecure. And this is where I ask to connect with us, connect with your family, connect with your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors, uh, talk about uh, the issues you're going through, how you're feeling. Um, and if you want to talk to us outside of these briefings, we do have the private LinkedIn group where you can connect with me and I'll invite you to that to keep those conversations going. So please stay connected to please share how you're feeling um, with us and with uh, the people close to you. Thank you very much, Twee. I'm now going to invite uh, colleagues who are on the call to actually do very brief sharing. If you could just try to, uh, to do it in, in the space of, of, of a couple of minutes. We have some colleagues here who worked or have worked for the World Food Programme, and, and I'm going to call you in soon. Uh, certainly, Gawaha, I'm going to call you. And I think, Lynn Brown, you might also be ex-World Food Programme. Uh, if you don't want to be called in, could you put a note in the chat line saying, don't call on me? Uh, in fact, anybody who doesn't want to be called in, uh, just write, don't call on me. Otherwise, I'm in the mood where I want to hear from lots. Just to uh, express it raw and clear. Uh, one person who's, who's feeling very raw uh, and I think frustrated uh, is um, Florence Egal. What I, what I don't want to do, Florence, is to say to you how terrible it is that there is 24 over 7 constant COVID news, because that's not something I can do anything about, and I don't think you can either. But I think what we can do is to think about what to do to take advantage of this focus on COVID and try to see whether it, or not it can help get better things happening in other areas. Flora Segal, you have the floor. No, as, thank you very much, David. As you know, I really believe that uh, COVID is really revealing a series of weaknesses that you repeatedly mentioned, and therefore it can be a catalyst to be rethinking uh, the whole way we do development. I agree with John, we need to really give priority at local level. The comment I was putting in writing is just, I'm very concerned in my everyday life when I see the social tension and the, I would say, psychotic cases I know around me of people that are absolutely completely hanging on TV, absolutely terrified, and that are being fed information which I think is not correct. The situation in Italy is not the one that was in March, but it generates just as much anxiety. And I think if we want credibility in the information, it's important that people know about clusters, that people go get tested, that all these things are done and thank God we can do it now. But I think it is also important to give some more positive feedback on the way the situation is evolving. So I agree this is very much Italy-based, but I think it's very important not to be constantly dramatic but also the very important point you made, some people have got the disease, they're young, and they've been for months fighting with the disease. And I think that's very important. That doesn't come out in the news. What a good point. Can I just say two things to Florence? So, uh, the first is Florence Egal, you are a, a, really a force of nature. You've always got observations on development issues that are right on, whether it, we're talking about food in urban contexts, whether we're talking about some of the challenges of urban agriculture. Now, second point, I think you've done us a real service. The situation in Europe right now is hugely different from how it was in March or April. The, the COVID is being held back. And yes, there are spikes. And yes, there are odd surges that occur, but they are recognized and are being dealt with. And we must give credit to the countries that are finding cases and localizing them and then working on them locally, that are bringing together different groups of actors. I watch what's happening in Spain, 
in Italy, in France, in Belgium, in Britain, in Ireland, in Netherlands and beyond. And I think, wow, there is a lot of learning going on here. And it's really good. And sometimes I think we can be more courageous. You know, I watch the, the, the real care and anxiety about schools. And I'm saying, no, no, we've got to be able to do this. We've got to be able to go to school with COVID in our midst. We've got to be able to socialize with COVID in our midst. Thank you, Florence, such a good point. And I'm gonna hold on to that. Uh, let's go to others. Um, uh, I've got uh, Tracy, Tracy, I love it. When you join, here you are, and you're gonna talk, I hope, a little bit about schools in British Columbia. You have the floor. Tracy, you might be muted, you might not. Or you might yeah, sorry. Okay, there I am. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the teachers push back and school will not be opening till mid-September to allow teachers time to assess their classrooms and protocols. Uh, and the children from grade five and up will have to wear masks and uh, in the classroom as well as in uh, high traffic areas. Classrooms will be up to 30 children, so distancing is not uh, possible. Children under grade five, up to grade five, the younger children, will uh, masks will be optional for them. Mm. So these children are all in school together, yeah. the younger children and the grades up to grade seven. So there's a bit of a conflict there. And um, so my grandchildren are in both those uh, grade groups in the same school. Uh, so, you know, I worry about them and uh, I probably will not be able to see them as much when they return to school, certainly not before the end of September. Um, so that's a worry for me and it's a worry for their parents. Yeah. I mean, uh, Tracy, I've been talking to lots of people, including in my own family, about the uh, return to school challenge. Gosh, if only we were clearer on what the risks are. Uh, we're together with Catherine and uh, Twee, we've just been involved in trying to summarize all the data. And then we went back to our friends in WHO and asked them to help us. And we poured through some of the new studies. But we're not yet able to say with certainty just what level of precaution is necessary and we keep getting reports for example from israel or from south korea of outbreaks in schools fortunately not associated with uh, really high levels of disease but still it's problematic i suppose what i'd like to say to everybody is we're in the middle of an extraordinary experiment when it comes to going back to school or going back to university and let's all try not to get too uh, absolutely mad with each other and see it as a collective learning experience. I feel that that's what you're doing, Tracy, even though I did see in the note that you wrote that it needs more thought. But it will almost certainly mean that we have to think on it together. Nobody's going to have the definite answer. And, and Tracy, thank you for the way you are and what you're doing. And I hope that you're able to feed in some of this wonderful wisdom that we're learning from you uh, in these briefings back into your community in British Columbia. Are you? Certainly I am. I, I talk it up a lot and I share um, uh, the narratives. I, I send them out to, um, very, I try and inform the government. I don't know if they read them because they, all they send back are links to their uh, general site. So it's a bit frustrating there. <laughs> yeah. You've always, my, my experience is you've always got to hope one in a hundred read something. <laughs> uh, and I want to ask Twee to make sure that uh, we can get a message through to Tracy. We've got access when uh, the wonderful thing that you're doing with Catherine uh, on um, schooling and university and so on, which we're just finishing now. So it'll go, it'll be posted very shortly. Need to make sure. Uh, what can you say, Twee? Can we get it to Tracy? We will get it to you, Tracy. And I'll also post a link in our LinkedIn chat group as soon as it's available. Now, Thank if, you. Uh, good. Iman has chimed in just pointing out that there are some issues on class sizes in Ontario. Iman, uh, half a minute from you. You're so welcome always being with us. You just have to unmute. If you can unmute. Can you just press the unmute button, Iman? Otherwise, I have to move to somebody else. 
Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So thank you. I wish to highlight a point or to, to stress on the point of needing functioning uh, public health systems in all of the countries. Um, I'm looking at Sudan. I will give examples and then uh, mention the policy implications. Yeah. Sudan is now witnessing floods. It's, it already has a um, huge massive floods all over the country and it has a weak health system. Plus there is now a mutant strain of polio virus, wild polio virus. So you can see all of these complex issues on top of existing COVID. People are totally, I think they're just abandoning their thinking about COVID and diving deep into the water to rescue others and so on. That's uh, on, on the side of uh, a disrupted health system where um, the situation is impossible. In Canada, I, I did mention that uh, Ontario class size remains the same. Yes, we are very worried and uh, families are just... Uh, Families are pushed to make the decision yeah. of whether to send their children back to school or homeschool them. Yeah. They are spending more on homeschooling, buying computers for their kids, setting up the homes and all of these things. I'm seeing it day to day, talking to my friends and extended family. So, right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. John, have you got any comments on what you just heard from um, Imam or anybody else so far? Well, I think what we're seeing david is is what happens when you get quite a rapidly evolving and very complex situation is people want simple answers they want clarity you know should we lock down should we not should we wear masks should we not should we open schools yes or no and it, it's harder than that and the key is to really keep as we said focusing on what's happening in that place and what can be done and the more that we keep sharing knowledge from good trusted reliable sources the better people are to, able to make sense. But if we keep looking for the yes, no answers in these things, the, they just aren't there. So there we go. No, yes, no answers. And do you know the trouble with the world we live in, which is very dominated by social media, with everything in tight clips, is we tend to try to go down to the yes, no, or what I call the binomial. Thank you, John. Hold on to John's truths. Jane Badham is often with us. She talks to us from South Africa. If you, could re if you can release yourself, there you come, Jane. Now, Jane, what you're saying is, we're not gonna be able to stay in lockdown forever. But at the same time, when you release lockdown, a lot of people think you're just going back to normal. Can't we find a third way, which is we don't stay in lockdown, but we don't go back to where we were before. Instead, we adopt a lifestyle which is compatible with living with COVID. Am I right, Jane? Absolutely. And David, I think what I'm really saying is that I think your seven principles are just so important. But I think, again, we're seeing many countries who perhaps haven't yet got those messages of those seven principles, and they aren't in place. We have the, uh, the population not being fully engaged. We no. don't have integration at the local uh, level. We're not seeing health services fully return to normal. Um, so we're seeing many of these issues at the same time that for economic reasons and absolutely understanding, uh, understandable, I'm watching the economic devastation around me. More and more families that I'm needing to try and, and give some support to, especially little businesses. Um, that just are crushed. And so this really, this lives and livelihoods issues, we've been encouraged to go back to restaurants to support the restaurant industry. But at the same time, we're still having these really, you know, 200 odd deaths a day. So it, it's very difficult to find that balance between lives and livelihoods. And people here seem to put you on one of the, behind one of those or the other, and, and the two aren't also really meeting again. So maybe that's something else for you to talk about. Yeah, I'm really keen that we keep focusing on being able to do both and and not either, either or. I read the Daily Maverick, Jane, every day, uh, slightly religiously now. Uh, this is an extraordinary South African newspaper and everything is laid out so starkly and the way you've just done it just now is so important. Special welcome everybody to Gawaha Atif. Gawaha worked with me over the years. I don't know where you are Gawaha and I uh, would just be, give you a super welcome. Uh, just to, uh, uh, if you can, quite quick, uh, one minute, quick take on how your life is going and how this fits with you. 
David, thank you so much. I've been following you since the beginning of this crisis. Initially, I was in Egypt and, and uh, now I'm in, in Montreal. And excuse my color, I had a little bit of a sports accident. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm based in Montreal. I'm, I'm not with WFP anymore. I, I retired a couple of years ago and uh, I watch closely what's going on there. And clearly we have a, a serious food crisis globally, uh, concerns about Africa and, and, and different parts of the world that, that are struggling with, with uh, producing their own food. Yeah. And we talked about Lebanon where I was based uh, a couple of years. It's, it's heart-wrenching and WFP is there. COVID is on the rise again in, in Lebanon and they're facing loads yeah. of problems. Back here in Montreal, where I am, I, I think we, we're back, I'm listening intently to what everybody's saying. And David, once again, you're, you're inspiring as always. Yeah. And I learned a great deal from you over the years and certainly when I worked with you on avian flu. Um, it, here in Montreal, the schools are back. They've closed some because they've had small outbreaks. Uh, things are, it's, it's trial and error. It's learning as we go. I think the, the big issue uh, in, in my mind is asymptomatic people. How do you, the children might be asymptomatic, adults, young adults, uh, you know, slightly older adults. This, I, I may, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm concerned about the, the 35 and less who might be serving us in a restaurant or in a shop who, yeah. who don't show the symptoms. And those of us who are a little bit older than that and, and care for people who are older, and you know what happened to the elderly here in Montreal and the long-term care homes, it's, it's, it's quite calamitous. And some of the associations I'm working with here, we're trying hard to make sure that we push the legislation to get something done for the elderly care homes because it was absolutely disastrous here. We lost a lot. I'm really bad. Thank so, you. It's nice, nice, nice to be reconnected. Thanks for reminding us of that just want to say while you were talking georgina said uh, going to school in montreal uh, is mandatory it's the law it's very interesting uh, just uh, how countries are taking that differently We've got a lovely collection of people from canada here gawa has a dear dear friend and as she said we work together remarkably on preparing for flu pandemics uh, rebecca Cantor is in chile she's a expert on food just wonder Say, Rebecca, thank you very much for being with us. You've been very clear about the importance of COVID-ready food systems. And you represent in this group somebody who is very much at the interface between what we're doing on COVID as a human family and what we're doing on food systems. And you pointed out to me how COVID has revealed incredible problems in food systems, including where you work in Chile. Thank you for that. Uh, Scott Knox, you're also another person joining us from Canada. I think you're in Toronto. I, I don't know whether you're... Yes, there you are, Scott. Scott, what are you seeing? I mean, you're dealing with a large number of advertising agencies who are all connecting with people who are dealing with COVID. Do you find your clients are basically trying to go about things while ignoring COVID? Or are they bringing COVID themed into their advertising in some way or other? Or is it actually becoming a dominant feature? Over to you, Scott. Yeah, um, thanks, David. Um, the, the, the odd thing is that we've just had some research come out in Canada that now it's actually been commissioned in other countries in the world uh, because there was a point in time where every ad you saw on television uh, or, or indeed online featured a crying nurse or, uh, you know, insert Adele music and away you go as, as, as a brand communication at the start of the pandemic. Mm. What has been really interesting is we've now got research in the industry that says in terms of what the public wants and what the public reacts to, they don't care whether it's COVID related or non-COVID related. It has zero impact on brands and whether they sell or work or not, which poses a really interesting dilemma for us because there are lots of brands in the world that want to do really supportive, cause related, supportive communication for COVID, but consumers are not taking it and they're not taking it from brands. And so I think we've got an interesting dilemma here about this, the whole conversation we've had about trust and who we trust. Is it brands? Is it governments? Is it who the hell? And I think we need to, whilst we've got things we've got to handle now, the long term thing we need to wrestle with the societies across the world is actually what we've done to depoliticize 
people have got bored with politics, people have got bored with interacting with community. We have a, people think that taxation is a nasty, horrible, awful thing, when actually it's collective endeavor. We've got a big problem in our society across the world that we need to wrestle with. If we are gonna face something like this in the future with much more positive forward for action. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. That is uh, super important from a guy who studies the research that advertisers are using to pitch brands who says all sorts of things at the moment are turnoffs. Politics is a turnoff. COVID is a turnoff. Communities are turnoff. Tax is a turnoff. So trying to find a way to reestablish the positive features that actually deep down inside people know are good is a challenge. Scott, we have to work together. Thank you very much for being with us. And not only you, but for all your colleagues in the industry. Chris Lara comes from a different area. He's working in global diplomacy. He's been operating in uh, international affairs, worked with me on Ebola. He's at Duke University. We're a, a week, a, a month on since we were together at our seminar. Chris, how does life look, particularly with classes restarting? Yes, uh, hi everyone. Thank you, David. Um... It's really nice to be back, yeah, the briefings. Well, the US, uh, we have fires in the west, on the west, uh, hurricanes uh, on the east, uh, politics all around, protests all around the country. And I think um, it's really, I think an, an example of the anti-five points that you, you, you propose. We saw last week the uh, Republican National Convention we saw an event at the White House with 1,200 people, leaders of this country without mask, showing the, the whole country a bland and, you know, displays of uh, insensitive behavior, but actually I would say that is criminal because we are in, at the center of the pandemic. And I would say that being in Africa, with Mauricio Calderon and, and David, we work in, in West Africa during the Ebola response. We could see how the world reacted when in Sierra Leone, for instance, people started not following the rules and violating the quarantine and all these measures. And I would say that why the international community doesn't react more strong, strongly against this kind of behaviors by the U.S. government just because it's the U.S. You know, uh, we, it can be actually perceived as a condescending attitude of the international community with the African countries when, when something is, is not going well here and is wrong, the international community should speak out more clearly. And I think, I don't know what is the, the, the what happened in um, WHO, but... Uh, supports you. I saw a lot of nodding. How come the international community is not speaking out about the extraordinary challenges being faced inside the United States right now? After all, the US is relevant to the whole world. Chris, thank you. Uh, we will hold that. I hope you'll continue to join us and we can go on with this theme. You've got others agreeing with you. Oh gosh, what a, what a, what a, a resonance. Henk Beckerdam, Dutchman, man of the world, was on one of our previous ones. He's sitting there, I can't resist it. Henk, what do you see happening? Look, look from a, your global perspective, but also your India hat, please. Thank you, David. Uh, great energy and, and always an inspiration. I think your seven points were very comprehensive. Recently, I, I shared with an audience and I had five lessons that I learned from my time working in, in WHO and dealing with infectious diseases. Very similar. And, and, and if you don't mind, I'll pick up just two or three. The five points very quickly are, was sail, sailing while building the ship. That's always that learning. And I think we all have said it. I will not repeat it too much. But the learning component is extremely important. It's a new disease we're still learning. The second one, infectious diseases, you have to act immediately, but never too late to engage. The third one is prevention is the best. And prevention is the best, that's a whole thing. And, and many things you have already uh, covered. But more important than ever, with such a high percentage of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic, 
who are able to, to infect others unknowingly. And I think that makes it so challenging. Therefore, the prevention component is even more important than ever before. The fourth component is what I think many of you, and including John, you have already mentioned it, John Atkinson, is about national coordination and international cooperation. Here about we need to generate and share knowledge. And, it's, and in order to learn uh, better and faster, you need to work together. You need to share, uh, you need to have protocols that you, get to, that, that you earlier get evidence built, etc. Very important. Also the sharing of resources, whatever comes. A new vaccine, a new diagnostics, new uh, treatments. Uh, we need to make sure that then there is that cooperation. And the fifth one is about leadership and working with the community. And there you come back to issues what Scott has been mentioning, the trust. How can you have, you cannot have trust as no good leadership, but you can also have no trust if you don't understand the community you're working with. David, you worked in Ebola. It was so important that we start understanding the people in order to, to come with good preventive measures. Now we need to work as well with the young people as with the elderly, etc. So th these are things, and, and I, I, I really think that's excellent what you said. But that's very important, and that's where I think that more needs to be done, is about this dashboard. I still think that countries need to be guided what that dashboard is, and having an information system, which is precise enough that you can locally act, and not only coming with very big, uh, big messages, etc. We need to go understand this locally happening. Sorry for my time. Oh my goodness me. Hank, just simply by stressing, you as a public health leader who's worked in so many crises, and I've been with you in many of them, stressing that actually without trust you can't do anything. How often do you hear this when uh, young medical students are trained in public health? How often do you hear it when governments are talking? Oh, so important. And, and we, all of us, you know, just ask John, ask Twee, Ask anybody else on this call, do we know about what it takes to build trust? I think we do. Loy Rago has been really important in helping us get uh, uh, some small groups emerging out of this. Loy, how's it going? Do you think we've got something happening? We're going to stop in a second. Sorry, I just wanted to hear Loy's voice. Loy. No, I, I don't think we have got anything going so far, but I am happy to uh, support any effort. As I told you, I'm in between two countries. I'm Indian. I can help with India. I am located in Egypt, where I spend most of my time, so I can help there. And beyond these two countries, I don't want to expand further. So local effort within these two countries, I'm happy to learn more about. And yeah can contact me, I can contact people. So happy to support that. I believe local level, national level, no, local level work is important. Thank you very much indeed. Leo Marie, is there anything you want to say as we close? You've been so patient. Hi, I don't have anything uh, grand to, to offer. I'll just share personally, I recently flew with Swiss Air and I can say that they did a great job of essentially recommending the best practices. Yeah. They, you know, they, they did not enforce to the non-compliers, but they, they recommended the mandatory use of masks. So I, it was a very safe experience and I wish safety to all on the call. Thank you. Sarah Phillips, how's your daughter? How are you? Hi there. Um, all good, thank you. Busy, I'm catching up. Um, so yeah, good, but all good, thank you. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Carlos and Veronica, how are you doing? How's life in Cancun? Everything's uh, well. I believe we, we are making progress. Yeah. Uh, what was said of trust is very important. And uh, I believe truly that to manage this crisis, it's important that governments at the highest level just put on the guidelines, yeah. but the work should be done in regional uh, form, not from a federal form. So that's another person making it very clear. I know Maurizio, you would agree. Uh, uh, we, we've always talked about this. I think we have to stop because 
life, unfortunately, for many of us has to go on. As you might have gathered, I love this format. I love the fact that we're talking, we're having a continuous conversation. It picks up from week to week. We have different people participating. It's not always the same. We're always looking at issues through slightly different. Hello, Ruti. Thank you for undoing your video. It's lovely to see you. But I am going to stop now. But before I stop, I go, first of all, to Twee. Uh, and I'll come and say hello to Zara in a second. But Twee, is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Yes, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Do uh, follow the recordings on our website, forestd.info. Connect with me on LinkedIn to join our chat group. And uh, for those of you who can join us on Friday morning as well, uh, I will see you there. Now, Zara, thank you very much, Tweet. Zara, you're younger than most of us. You're dealing with this COVID. It's a whole new thing. Uh, what does it feel like through your eyes? Zara's, I won't embarrass her by saying how old she is. Uh, it's different because like school is in Zoom and it's like you can't really, can't like socialize with anyone. And I've just started a new school and I don't really know anyone and I can't exactly socialize with them. Well, I hope that it improves soon. And to big, big fondness and love to your dad, Miles, and your mum, Jo. <laughs> oh, well. Is he there? <laughs> right, great. There you go. Thank you very much <laughs> to Miles, uh, Joe, and Zara. The, in Nairobi, uh, Joe looking uh, responsible for some coordination of activities in Somalia and sending me stuff all the time. Everybody, I wish I could talk to you all for hours, but now we're going to stop. And um, Rojan Dahl, thank you again for your messages, in particular for reminding me of just how awful the situation is uh, for poorer people in Kathmandu and in Nepal and in fact, right across the whole Indian subcontinent. Just what a desperate situation this is. Nobody must forget it. Nobody must forget how bad it is. And Rojan just said to me, if only we stopped actually testing everybody, but just tested a few people, it would look as though our lockdown is going much better. It's an awful, awful series of conundrums for national governments. The more honest you are, the more you can end up getting your country in headlines for the wrong reasons. Thank you very much indeed, Rojan. I am supporting you always. Namaskar. So with that, team gets thank you. Uh, you all get thank you. The, the result of today's show has got a beautiful thing from Chris. We'll go for him for the last part. And it'll go on the website as well. So let's get Chris's screen. Chris, you have the last word. Bye-bye, everybody. Chris, you are given the word. If you want to, Chris, if you can unmute, you can speak. Oh, no, why? Well, I... I'm just, um, I learned something new on every one of these. Uh, so I feel like I'm not exactly a world health expert. I'm really just a punter who's doing some drawing. But it's great to be a part of it. Thank you. Terry Jackson, we will connect with you. Uh, don't worry. Thank you very much indeed. It's super helpful. I forgot, of course, you've got access to a huge number of things. And uh, uh, just put, uh, you can get in touch with any time. Uh, uh, you like, I'd like that very much. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I can get my email in. Okay, everybody, we'll be connecting again next week. It'll be um, on uh, Tuesday. Uh, uh, sorry, be on. we're connecting this week on Friday uh, at uh, uh, 8.30 a.m. Uh, European time. And this time again next week on Tuesday. Wonderful to join you. Don't hesitate to, to stay in touch. We are such a powerful group and we are making waves. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.